Well, hey there guys, it's your favorite backyard geographer again. You know, sometimes people get confused and ask, well, how do you calculate the adiabatic lapse rate, both for dry and saturated air parcels when going up and down hills? Well, you're just in luck. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to use the adiabatic lapse rate to calculate temperatures while going up a hill. Well, let's get started. So the first thing that we can observe in this diagram is that we have a mountain that's been drawn and we can see that it does have markings of elevation. We can see a temperature at sea level at zero feet at 85.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And we can see that this mountain goes up in intervals of 1,000 feet until we hit the peak at 5,000 feet. So a couple things to point out. The first one is that we have a dew point. Well, what is dew point? Dew point is the temperature in which air must be cooled to become saturated with water vapor. When cooled even further, the airborne water vapor will condense to form liquid water. And when the air cools just to the dew point through contact with the surface, then the condensation will be observed on the surface and or rain. We also have two values. We have the DALR, which is the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is used for dry parcels of air. And we also have the SALR, which is the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. So, you know, the big difference between the dry and the saturated is we're looking at the amount of water vapor that is available within that parcel of air. Something else that I've done that I want to point out, and that is that I'm using a red 5.5 and a blue 3.3. That really just helps me distinguish the differences because what ends up happening is that as we gain altitude, as we go upward this mountain, we find that because the air is dry, the temperatures will decrease by 5.5 for every 1,000 feet. But once you hit dew point, we have to use the saturated rate, which is the 3.3. Now it is possible that air, an air parcel itself can go up a mountain and never hit dew point. But in our case, I think that we are gonna hit a dew point in which we'll need to use a different variable. Not to confuse you, but sometimes people ask, well, why does it change from 5.5 to 3.3 just because you hit dew point? Well, it has a lot to do with the different stages of matter because we learned earlier, and you also know, that as water changes its state of matter, energy is either going to be released or absorbed. So in this case, since we're going from a vapor to a liquid, it, we're going to have to have energy release, which actually causes a small atmospheric warming. Well, anyway, let's try this. So as we know that we're, we can move upward at 5.5 degrees of cooling for every 1,000 feet. Remember, it always gets colder going up the mountain. That's why we often find mountains have snow on the top and we only have rain down in the valley below. So that being said, when I'm, when I'm looking at this diagram, I can go, well, if I'm going to go from 85.5 degrees Fahrenheit at zero feet elevation, and I'm going to hike up to 1,000 feet elevation, therefore it must cool by 5.5. So I would subtract 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit from the 85, which will give me 80 degrees Fahrenheit a cooling of 5.5 degrees. Well, let's say that I go up one more set of 1,000 feet. What would the temperature be then? Well, again, I'm gonna subtract 5.5 from that 80. And that gives me 74.5 degrees. So what ends up happening is I'm showing you, and I'm, that's why I'm using the red numbers, the DALR, I'm subtracting that. I'm, it's actually, as we're going up the hill, the air continues to be dry, but it does get cooler by five and a half, 5.5 degrees for every 1,000 feet. Well, we do it again. I'm going from 2,000 to 3,000. I subtract again my 5.5, sorry, it's, and I'm using yellow, I'm trying to use different colors, 5.5 from the 74.5 and all of a sudden I get a different number. I'm now at 69 degrees Fahrenheit. I have just reached dew point. Since I've reached dew point from this point on upward, 
I must use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. No exception. Once you hit dew point, you've got to use it. So in this case, what I can end up doing is I'm now going to subtract 3.3. So I'm going to take 69 minus my 3.3. Again, I'm going to draw it out here, 3.3. And I subtract that. Well, what number do you get? Well, I get 65.7. Well, let's go to the peak of this mountain at 5,000 feet. So I end up subtracting another 3.3 .3 from the, my 65.7, which brings me to 62. Oops, 0.4. It's hard to draw on, on one of these here, 62.4 degrees. So as I can see, and perhaps even you've experienced this, you've done a morning hike, you hike to the top of that mountain, and then as you, you, know, as you go downhill back towards your vehicle, you realize it begins to warm up. Well, a lot of questions can come up from this. Well, why is it cooler when we go up the mountain? I thought heat rise. Well, you're correct, heat does rise off the surface, but only to a certain extent, right? because you have to remember that heat is caused by the release of that long wave radiation on the surface. So as you gain altitude, it does begin to cool down because you're getting farther away from that initial heat source. And we can see here, you know, from zero feet to 5,000 feet, there's a substantial cooling amount, right? We're looking at over 20 degrees in temperature cooling, which is pretty cool. Now, this is where it gets a little complicated. Something that you have to remember is that, let's say we're going to go on the other side. I'm going to go from 5,000 feet, I'm going to walk down to the other side of this mountain. When we go downhill, we know that it's going to warm up. But you always, always, when going in that pattern of going from uphill and now going on downhill from that leeward side, you must use, must, must, must use the dry adiabatic lapse rate. You always use it on this side, and that's because if we really think about this in a bigger picture, we're looking at essentially orographic lift or the rain shadow effect. So, not you know, in this case, if a cloud, let's say we had a cloud that was here, and here's my little cloud. As my cloud is being forced up through orographic lift, when it hit dew point, that cloud would become darker and it would begin to condense, and there'd be the possibility of precipitation. There's also going to be an energy release in that sense. Then once the cloud breaches the, pe the peak of my mountain, it's going to be pushed down very quickly, right, because of pressure. And in doing so, you must use the dry rate. So what's interesting about this is we know we've gone a total of 5,000 feet, or 5, right? Meaning that if I wanted to, I could go, well, my 5,000 feet times 5.5 right? Because we're using the dry rate. So I'm going 5,000 feet. 5 times 5.5 is equal to 27.5. That means it's going to warm up by 27.5 degrees down here at zero because it takes me 5,000 feet of elevation to go down that hill, right? So therefore I add, to find out this temperature right here, I'm going to add my 62.4 plus my 27, oh, excuse me, 27.5. Sorry guys, and this is really hard to, to read there. Which will get me a new temperature on this side. In fact, it'll be a little bit higher than the windward side of this mountain. Well, I'm not going to provide that answer for you. I did the math. I know you can solve it. Be sure to write your answer in the comments below. Be sure to ask any questions if you have those as well. I hope this was a little bit helpful to show the difference between the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the saturated adiabatic lapse rate and why we can see a temperature difference from the valley floor to that mountain top. Again, don't forget to like this video, subscribe if you haven't, and we'll talk soon.